pride. We should have enough pride to say, yes, I belong to God. I'm pride. Uh, he gave me some gifts. He gave me some talents. I'm able to, to speak well because I had a good education. I'm able to do this well because I had this. But I realized one thing. Watch this. It says, however, if pride becomes extreme, that is when humility is absent. And a person may exhibit selfish or the word narcissistic is self-absorbed behaviors. If a person begins to think that they are better than others and only makes decisions that depend on what's best for them, then they are considered self-centered and prideful. Obsessive pride makes it difficult to be considerate to others or form genuine relationships. As a body of believers, fellowship means more than just sitting down and having a nice plate. The koinonia word that, that means fellowship means that we come together. It doesn't matter if I'm a doctor making $500,000 a year or if I'm just a regular bus driver making $13,000 a year. When we come together and we sit at the table, we got something in common. And that one thing in common is Jesus. The fact that he died on the cross for each and every one of us. So if I got enough money to pay all your bills or if I don't have enough money to meet my bills, we got something in common. We all meet at the same table. And that table is a table that Jesus has prepared for us. Amen? There should be no schisms, as the Bible says, in the body. There should be no separation in the body. I should not be able to, to be able to go down and talk to Pastor King because he's the adjutant general. And, and see, my motives might be wrong because I'm trying to lean up to him because I'm trying to get to Bishop Kimball. Oh, y'all missed that one. Y'all missed that one. Or sometimes we lean up on somebody else because we think that person can take us to the place where we think we need to go. Oh, my Jesus, that's, that's hard now. That's hard. That's hard. See, people who are too prideful may not notice or realize that there are areas in which they need to improve on. Let me give you an example. Naaman. Second Kings chapter 5 talks about Naaman, captain of the army, highly respected man, valiant warrior, but he had a disease. He was a leper. Amazingly enough, his wife's mistress, who was an Israelite, tells him of a prophet who could help him with this issue. The king of Aram sends a letter, money, Naaman, and, and Naaman to the king of Israel to be cleansed. The king of Israel rents his clothes and says, my God, man, he's trying to start a fight with me. I'm paraphrasing. Elisha overhears this conversation, the prophet, Elisha the prophet, and he offers to help so that people will know that there is a God in Israel. See, sometimes when you're being nosy and you hear a particular thing, it's not so that you can just kind of know the information and share it. It's because people need to know that there is a God that's in Eatonville. People need to know that there's a God in Apopka. People need to know that there's a God in Orlando. People need to know that there is a God that still needs you to be saved. Watch. Now, let's go in 2 Kings 5. Um, I'm sure you already turned there. Go to verse 9. So Naaman, Naaman goes over, comes with his horses and his chariots, and he stands at the doorway of the house of Elisha. Elisha, watch this. He says, Elisha sent a messenger to him. Elisha didn't come out there and said, go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. Look at the next verse. Naaman was furious. You mean to tell me? I, I work up under the king. I'm the head usher. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the president of the company. You mean to tell me you're going to send a messenger to me? The president? How dare you? Got all upset. He said, behold, I thought he surely would come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Poor Naaman. And then, here's the worst part. Jordan River Dirty, he's talking about, are not Abna and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he walked off. <sighs> just mad, ugly, angry, upset, all this kind of stuff, right? Y'all y'all, y'all know how it is. You ever, been, you ever just been, um, you go to a store, and you know, maybe you go to a restaurant, and it take them a long time to seat you, and then all of a sudden you get this old attitude, well, I'm just going to leave, because they don't even want to take care of us. They don't, don't want to feed. They don't, they don't want my money. They don't want me. P-R-I-D-E spells pride. <sighs> Watch this, though. Verse 13, then his servants came near and spoke to him. Now, notice now, Elisha never came and addressed him. Why do you think Elisha never came to address Naaman? Because God had to humble Naaman. 
Sometimes we pray and we ask God for things. I ask God for strength, so he puts me in a situation where I have to be strong. <laughs> he don't necessarily send you strength. You know, he's not going to have you shake yourself like Samson. He's going to send you a situation that's going to force you God, I need a word. I just need a word from you, God. And you're waiting on a prophet to call you on the phone, and you wait for somebody. And then some little kid on a bicycle walk by and says something just off random, randomly, matter-of-factly. But it hits exactly the way your situation, and you question and wondering whether God is trying to talk to you. Y'all yeah. yeah. know Balaam, when he was headed towards another country, he riding on a donkey, and the donkey stopped in the middle of the road. He bashing the donkey upside his head, talking about, where you going? What you doing? And the donkey had to turn around and say, man, don't you see this angel in the middle of the road? Pride can blind you. Pride will blind you from the blessing that God has for you. Pride will keep you from being conformed to the image of his son. We pray that prayer. God, you're the potter. I am the clay. I've never seen a potter be nice to a piece of clay. Because sometimes, you know, after they wet it and then they got it all wet and put it in a particular part, they got to put it in a certain form and it looks good and they're looking at it and they keep looking at it and they keep looking at it like, something ain't right, something ain't right, something ain't right. And you know what they do? They start taking that chisel and start knocking stuff off. See, sometimes we think we're in the place that God wants us to be, and then God goes, ah, something's still missing, something's still missing. Then he got to chop that off. He might chop a couple of friends out your life. You got people walking away from you. You know, he... He might, he might have you get demoted on your job so he can show you that he can provide for you even if you get a demotion. See, 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 we ask God for things, but we never look for God to provide in the way that he can provide for us because we have this pride. Luke chapter 18 talks about it this way. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, a religious leader of the time, and the other a tax collector. Probably one of the most hated people at that time because they were cheating, you know, they cheat folks, right? The Pharisee stood, um, if you want to read it on your own, Luke 18, um, 10. The Pharisee stood and was just praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. That's how we do now. When we get real holy, we get that God voice on. You know, the mighty God shall take care of thee in the mighty wisdom of the... What's wrong with us? That's sometimes we, we scare people off of Jesus. Because now we think we got... Ah, oh, shit! Ah! Oh! They're like, you, you got Tourette's? What's going on? You got a, what's wrong with you? Anyway. He said, look at what he says. This is the, this is the worst part right here. Oh, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. See, the scripture tells us this. The scripture says that whenever we do things, we do things so the right hand can't tell what the left hand does, right? We do things, he said, if you want to pray, go into your closet. And then he says something so profound in the scripture. He says, and the God that sees in secret shall reward you openly. So that praying and all that crying you're doing in your secret closet, when you come out of your closet, uh, but before you go into your closet, you got to leave some stuff here on the altar and then go back into your closet, humble yourself, okay? And then God will reward you openly. But look at the tax collector. The tax collector says this, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. We are all sinners saved by grace. We can't have so much pride that we can't lower ourselves to help someone who needs Jesus. So what is humility? If pride is this overthinking of ourselves, what is humility? See, humility isn't always seen as a strength, but sometimes it's thought about as a weakness because we think we have to be weak in order to be humble. No, no, that's not the case. Some people believe that having a low opinion of yourself, low self-esteem, and a lack of confidence is humility, but really it's not. Because when we can boast, see, the scripture says when you boast, you boast in the Lord. Y'all know the word. Y'all know the word. You know, when we go in confidence, we walk in the confidence of the Lord. The scripture says be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
I can lift all the weights I want to. I can be Lou Ferrigno, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm way old school. I know I don't know at all the new bodybuilders. I can be as big as I want to be, strong as I want to be, pretty as I want to be, smart as I want to be, whatever it is that I want to be. I can be all those things, but without God, none of that is possible. See, in fact, all the stuff that I read to you earlier about low opinion, low self-esteem, lack of confidence is the opposite. Humility is having the self-esteem to understand that even though you are doing well, you do not have to brag or gloat about it. Let me give you a quick example. Daniel in chapter one. You don't have to turn to it. I'll read it for you. See, Daniel made up in his mind in verse eight that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food and the wine which he drank. So he went and sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now, granted, now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And then he went and told, told the king, he said, look, please test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. And then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food. Notice how he did that. He negotiated with the king, but God had to give him the favor. Don't go to your boss talking about, see, God told me to come up here and talk to you. You're supposed to give me a raise. The Holy Ghost said, give me a raise in the name of Jesus. My promotion is sitting on your desk. God told me so. Okay, wait for it. Humble yourself. This is a lesson in humility. Now, let's go back to James for a moment. Verse 6. This verse here. The B part is what I want to focus on. It says, God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. In this particular verse, humble is translated to make small, to reduce one's self-importance, or to humble oneself from previous arrogance. According to James, those who do this, do this on purpose. That is, believers who willfully submit to God's commandments and turn from their arrogant ways will become recipients of grace. Let me talk about grace for a moment. Not the grace we pray at the, at the, at the table. This grace. This word grace is a Greek word, charis, all right? And it means that God freely extends himself inclining to people because he is inclined to bless them. Now, how do we get God's favor? Not this way. It's this way. James gives us some ideas on how to get God's grace. Look at verse 7 in James chapter 4. He says, submit therefore to God. Now, to submit means, you know, if you, I, I'm a wrestling fan. So, you know, when you get put in the figure four or you get put in the scorpion death lock or you get put in the sleeper, they do one of these things. You got to do what they call tap out. You got to tap out. God, this right here, I can't do on my own. I tap out, God. I'm giving that to you. The Bible says in all things with prayer and supplication, make your request be made known to uh, Pastor King. Oh, the Bishop King. Oh, the Bishop Kimball. Oh, Call your mama and ask her to pray. The Bible says, make your request known to God. And then he says, the peace of God. Yeah, y'all know what I'm talking about. Look, he says, submit therefore to God. Then he says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, to resist the devil means more than just saying, devil, I ain't playing today. Devil, you too busy. You know, um, oh, I can't think of the thing they say. Devil, I ain't got time today. Whatever they say. You know, because everything that we go through doesn't necessarily, is not attributed to the devil. Sometimes it's just attributed to our own bad decisions, our own messed up decisions. And so what we have to do is we have to make sure that we're like David when David sinned with Bathsheba and we go to Psalms 51 and we begin to read. He says, against you and you alone, Lord, have I sinned. He said, Lord, don't withdraw me. Don't take me from your presence. God, restore in me the right spirit. He said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit. I know the um, NASB says a steadfast spirit within me. I have to resist the devil, but I have to continually ask God to help me resist the devil. You cannot fight spiritual with the flesh. You cannot squeeze your eyes tight enough. You can't holler loud enough. You can't stomp through your house hard enough. No, you fight spiritual with spiritual. Guess what? We got a weapon, which is the word of God. If you don't know it, you can't use it. 
if you're not trained in how to use it, you're probably going to cut yourself in the leg a couple of times. Because sometimes you try to pick up a right kind of sword and you're going to drop it and, and cut your leg on the side. You ever try to pick up a heavy gun or you try to shoot a gun for the first time and you don't know how to handle it and boom, that thing feed back and you hit yourself in the forehead with it? Why are we trying to fight the devil with stuff that we know we can't win with? That means, saints of God, humble yourself. Get in this word. Get in this word. The Bible talks about the five-fold ministry. He gives us prophets and teachers and pastors and evangelists. It's not to make us better Christians. It's to lead you towards God. It's supposed to help you deepen your relationship with God. Because the Bible tells us that we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. I love my wife. I do. But I can't stand before God and say, well, God, you know, I kind of kept her because I had her cooking dinner and she was supposed to pray. You told her to pray, but I asked her to cook for me. So I, she's, she's accountable to God. And she tells me all the time, honey, I, I just want you to do what God says do. I don't care what you do. I don't care where you are. Honey, you better do what God tells you to do. See, that's a help that's suitable for you. <laughs> Thank God for my wife. Thank you. That was, that was free. All right. Let's keep going. Now, let me get in the scriptures because I want to make sure you hear this, okay? Verse 7 says, submit to God. Tap out. Stop trying to carry this weight on yourself. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn what Jesus can do. Read these scriptures. These scriptures were given for our example. We've got lots of examples in the scriptures of how people dealt with themselves and how they dealt with situations. They didn't fight physical with physical. Even if you read the Old Testament, some people don't believe the Old Testament, but it's true. It's true. God won battles without an army ever lifting a finger to fight. So why are we fighting amongst each other? Why are we fighting the devil with stuff that we know we're not going to win with? Why are we holding on to stuff that we need to leave at the altar of God? Humble yourself. Look at what he says in verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will do what? Draw near to you. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you plant grace, guess what you're going to get back? Grace. If you plant backbiting, guess what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The principles of God haven't changed. I don't care what generation you're in, Generation Z, Millennial, uh, you know, the, the baby boomers, whatever generation you're in, the word of God has not changed. We did. We pushed away from God. We watered down the word. We tried to make it easy and pliable. And see, we had these kids in children's church. They were jumping around and singing, and they were so happy to leave with some piece of candy, but they really didn't get the word, and now they don't know how to fight the devil because they weren't trained coming up. They don't know how to pray because we didn't sit down with them and teach them how to pray. Baby, when you do this, here, sit down and pray like this. When you do that. See, God gave us an example for that. Remember when Joshua took the um, Israelites over, and they crossed over, and they grabbed a stone? 12 stones for the tribes of Israel. And, he, and the scripture says it like this way. And the children said, why are we gathering these stones? Oh, baby, let me tell you. <laughs> I got to tell you this story right here. Because God did this. God opened up the Red Sea. And we walked over on dry ground. And man, God has been keeping us all these years. And here's the thing. If you read in Deuteronomy 8, oh, my goodness. God said, I took you to the wilderness to humble you and to test you. Now, 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 mind you, God knows everything. God knows what you're going to do before you do it. He already knows. The test ain't for God. The test is for us. The test is the litmus test for us to see where we are in our walk with Christ. And see, God had to humble the Israelites because, guess what? They had been walking around the wilderness for 40 years. He said, I humbled you, then I fed you with manna. Your clothes didn't wear out. Your feet didn't swell up. I kept you for 40 years, but every now and then, here they go, Lord, why you got us out in this wilderness? You're trying to kill us, Lord. Lord, we should have stayed in Egypt. Oh, my goodness, this Moses. Moses trying to kill us. Where Moses at? He ain't here. Why he up in the mountain? What are you doing up in the mountain? Lord Jesus. Oh, he ain't sent no manna. Oh, my goodness. I done took all this manna up, and I done kept it. I got more than what I needed for the weekend, but I kept it. Now it's staking in my house. Lord, what you doing? And God so many times wanted to kill them right there in the wilderness. But there was an intercessor. 
See, you might think that you're supposed to stand in this platform right here, but sometimes God has you as, as Bishop, Kimble, Bishop King said yesterday, he might have you as a spiritual sniper. You might have to just keep your mouth shut and go somewhere and pray and, and to see for the saints of God. But see, when you're in the body of Christ or when you're in this particular local body of Christ, you might be a pinky. You might be a thumb. You might be a big toe. You might be an anterior cruciate ligament. But whatever part you play in your body, play that part and play it well because that's where the growth comes from. Humble yourself and stop desiring something that somebody else wants because you don't know the mess they got to go through to get it. Yeah. Humble yourself. Stop thinking you all that. Oh, I, can, I know I can pray. I can pray till the wall sweat. Oh, you just give me that microphone and watch me pray. Watch me call. And then you sitting there waiting. You jumping. You can't wait. It's just like when you're playing jump, you know, when you're about to jump rope and you're trying to jump in, but you never can get the timing down and you're still trying to jump in, trying to jump rope, and you never get called because you never knew how to jump in because you're too busy talking. Verse 8 says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Wash your hands. Wash up. See, that was a ritual thing that they had to do before they ate and before they came to worship. Oh, see, see, I know that. I know the Bible. I know. Uh, I'm not saying the Bible. Lord Jesus, not that. I know the church vernacular says, come as you are. And, and you're right. Come as you are, but come with the right heart. And if you come with the wrong heart and you come with the wrong spirit, you done had the ten of meetings, hopefully you left the altar with a cleaner heart than you did when, before you got here. And then now when you get here, don't you ever come to a service and come the same way you came in. For what are we doing this for? Why we got this AC burning? Why we got the lights on? Why we even coming together if we not having no change take place in our lives? What are we doing here if ain't nobody getting healed? What are we doing here if we ain't got nobody coming in here who's drunk from last night and all of a sudden they feel sober and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost jump on them? Because we have to cleanse our hands. And he, 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 he ain't leave nobody out. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And if you've been in, been in this ministry, you've probably heard double-minded, double-souled. You're trying to live for God, trying to live for the world. You're trying to live for God, trying to live for the world. Cabbage patching up here for Jesus. <laughs> and then you wonder why your life is unstable. You wonder why you can't find no peace. You wonder why you can't find joy. You're always looking for happiness. But see, happiness is temporary. But joy is eternal. The Bible says with, with joy, we draw water from the wells of salvation. Ezekiel was asked, can these dry bones live? Lord, you know. Can this dry church live? If it's just the elders out here praying, are you waiting on the elders to call a prayer? If we too, too um, high class and high standard did that, you know, we just de desire so much excellence that we can't help a sinner. Me too. I'm, I'm not exempt from this worry, y'all. Have I done my part in the body of Christ so that I could be somebody to help shrink the size of hell? I got to clean my hands. I got to wash my hands. I got to repent. Y'all was praying at the altar. I was walking around like, Lord, help me. I got to do better. I got to tell somebody about Jesus. I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting the shakes just thinking about it. Because I got to stand before the Almighty. He says, be miserable. Mourn and weep. Cry. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Don't be happy where you are. Don't be satisfied with where you are. Desire more from God. Don't think you've arrived. Because we don't arrive until we've been formed into the image of his son. Anybody here, Jesus, Jesus Jr., Jesus the third? Any, anybody? We in the lineage. We got the blessings. The same resurrection power operates in us just like it does any one of us who stands in this platform. Anybody else who wears a collar, you have the same power that operates in you. See, we, we quote that scripture, now unto him who's able to do exceeding abundantly above that which we can ask or think. Yes, God does that, but he says according to the power that works in you. You have power. You have power. You have access 
to power through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We have access to power. We have access to delivering power. We have access to heal the crack addict. We have access to heal people who are addicted to the internet, addicted to pornography, addicted to lying, addicted to cheating, addicted to whatever it is that is so caught up in the culture. You have the power emanating through you. You've got the dunamis. Dynamite is a word that we use in the English. We got dynamite inside of us. And some of us, we got some duds. You ever light a pack of firecrackers and you try to light one and it's a dud? Yeah. It, just, it lights up, it's, and then, you know. If y'all watch Looney Tunes, what do they say? Where's the kaboom? I'm waiting on the kaboom. We have become spiritual duds because we have not humbled ourselves enough to say, I need to spend time in this. I need to spend time on my knees before God saying, help me a sinner. I got two more verses of scripture and we're going to go. Romans 12 says, for the grace given to me, I'll read it for you, 12, 3 uh, through 8. Read it on your own, on your own time. For the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as, as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. Somebody say one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's it. Christ who is all and Lord of all. One, one, one. The Bible even talks about the people who were at the, t the Tower of Babel. They decided in their own pride and their own arrogance that they were going to build this tower that was going to reach heaven. And God had to step down and use something. And the King James, I like it better that way because he says, this people is one. Can God look down on the life center and say, this people is, not was, this people is one. That the white collar and the blue collar can sit at the same table and talk about the same Jesus and be enriched. And that I don't feel like I got to get something from somebody who's above me. No, somebody who's, who's below me in, in, in title can give me something. I can learn something from that person. When we're there... God gives us his grace. He begins to incline himself towards us. When we begin to draw close to God, when we humble ourselves, he comes to us. 1 Peter chapter 5, I'll read that one to you too, verses 1 through 7. He says, therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. He says, shepherd the flock of God among you exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, not because you want a promotion, not because you want to be elevated, which we learn is, no, no, you ain't ready for them devils, all right? According to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. Be excited about what you're going to do for God, whatever it is. Be excited about your position in the body, whatever it may be. Be excited about being that third turbo on the right foot. And do it with everything that you have on the inside of you. Verse 4 says, and when the chief shepherd appears, let me put these glasses on so I can read it right. It says, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. He says, you younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. They got to tap out too. They got to want to learn some stuff too. Because sometimes you got to sit and be taught before you can go out and teach other people. Because uh, you'll be seven sons of one skiva, read Acts, all right? You're going to get beat down. Don't, don't play, all right? But then he says, and all of you, he was talking to the elders at first, but he's talking to everybody, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Look at that. He says the same thing again. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. You're waiting on a promotion, but it might not be your time. You know, we, we use that church vernacular. It's not my season. Well, wait on your season. And here's the thing that helps. Casting all your anxiety on him. 
Don't be, don't, don't, don't complain to your brother. Don't call your prayer partner. I'm like, man, I just need you to pray. Either he got to move or I got to move. God just got to do something. What is God trying to teach you in the midst of that mess? What is God trying to show you in those times of affliction? For yea, those who live godly shall endure persecution, endure afflictions. Paul told Timothy, endure hardness. That means he ain't going to move it. Go through it. Endure it. Because that's going to work something on the inside of you, and that's when he's going to start... Mm-hmm. Yep. Still got a little bit of business in that heart. Yep. Got to knock that off. Yep. Oh, 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 oh. I see that little backbite. You talk about so-and-so. I know you don't like him. He got, he got, a, he got a nail off. You've been talking. You've been talking. So you know they dirt. Keep it to yourself. Give it to Jesus. Here's the thing. This is the why. I'm going to close with this. It is important that we as seasoned believers in Christ seasoned. We've been in this for a while. We've been in this for a while. Be proud of the relationship we have with the Lord. Yeah, I've been serving God over 30 years, but not so much as we miss the opportunity to win the lost. We must begin how to understand how to make Acts 16, 31 and Romans 10 and 9 relevant in the lives of everyone. Acts 16, 31 says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And Romans 10 and 9 says that if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Last time I stood before you and I was telling you this, these two words, tell them. Tell them. That song still rings in my heart and my mind. Tell people about Jesus. Tell people that God is still doing what he's doing. You can't find him on Google. You can't find him on TikTok. You find the saints who think they believe it and they try to do all the dances and doing all the stuff and we just enjoy life. We listen to Beyonce. And we begin to mix stuff into the mix and then we can't ride that, 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 little, that little lazy river that God has for us because we too weighted down with stuff of the world. That's why the Bible says that we must lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and run with patience the race that is set before us. We got a race to run, y'all. We all going to get a prize at the end. We may never see ourselves get elevated here on the earth, but that's all right. Because if we know Jesus and if we tell others about Jesus, our reward in heaven will be so great. Stop worrying about the world. Stop worrying about being a millionaire. Stop worrying about having a whole bunch of money in your bank account. Start with Jesus. Start with Jesus because he gives you the power to get wealth. And that wealth, as we learned yesterday during the offering time, might not be a, a, a tenfold blessing in money. It might just be that that knee has been giving you a hard time for the past 10 years. All of a sudden, you're like, hey, my knee stopped hurting. God, you all right. That little migraine headache you've been dealing with for all these years because you were obedient and you humbled yourself. Oh, my goodness. I don't even feel them no more. I don't even need this. no. Man, that person that you just really just could not stand, all of a sudden, you start praying for them. You're like, oh, God, am I praying this about this person that did talk all about me? Did I do that? Yes. Because you humbled yourself before the almighty God. Tell them about Jesus. Humble yourself and lower yourself to the point where God can use you. Love the song choice yesterday for Bishop King. I give myself away. I give myself away. I die. I die. I die. To stay married as long as I have, I had to die. Had to give up football for a while. Had to give up. Had to give up buying myself CDs. Had to give up. Had to give up. Had to lay some stuff down. So that we could operate in unity. Because if we operating in disunity and there's schisms, we're not going to grow. Die. I love it. Stood right here and said, welcome to your funeral, brother. Yes. And y'all want this? <laughs> you sure you want this? You want to have an oil poured over your head? You sure you want this? You know, we don't hear a lot about prophets these days. Y'all sure y'all want that prophecy? Y'all sure y'all want to speak a word to somebody? Y'all know what it takes to do that? 
You know what kind of sacrifice that takes? Oh, you want to be a pastor? Oh, you want to you want to elevate yourself? Remember Jeroboam? We just talked about Jeroboam elevated himself, made his own worship days. You really want that? That's what you want. You reap what you sow. <laughs> you you better be careful what you ask for. You better wait for God. You better wait for God. For promotion comes not from the east or the west, north or the south, but God is the judge. Sets up one and puts down another. Mm. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you don't lose heart. I know I made a reference to Deuteronomy 8. I know I said I was closing. I'm doing a Baptist closing on you now. I'm getting ready to close. All right. In Deuteronomy 8, that little beginning part of the chapter, God talks about how he humbled them and fed them in the, in the, in the, um, in the wilderness. Forty years. Closing, get messed up. In the middle, he says, I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to take you to this great land. I'm going to take you to all these different places. But a little bit further down in that chapter, read it on your own now because you're going to see this. God said, don't forget the Lord your God. That's why humility is so important. We can get so high that we forget where we came from. Remove not the old landmark. You know, Lord, if I got a limp, it's okay. I'm good. Because if I can limp, that reminds me that I ain't have it all together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that limp. Thank you, Lord. If, 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 if I stutter a little bit, yes, yeah, all right. Thank you, Lord, for that stutter. I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait on you. Let's stand to your feet. I, I feel the need to pray. I feel the need to pray. I, need, I feel the need to pray, my God. If you do not know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, if you've been sitting here and you've heard this message, and maybe you don't know who Jesus is, now's a good time. The day that you hear his voice, don't let your heart be hardened. Maybe you need to rededicate. Maybe you need to just say, Lord, I've been doing this all wrong. I need to kind of check my heart. I want to open up the altar. I know we normally don't do an altar call, but I just feel so led to have people. And I think what will help us is if we just take that walk. Sometimes taking that little walk helps us. You know, if you've ever had to go to the office and get reprimanded and you got to take that walk of shame, you know what I'm talking about. It's all right. You're among friends here. We ain't going to talk about you. We're not. You bet not. All right. We want you here. If you need the Lord to heal you, power of God is present to heal. He's been doing it all morning long. I know somebody's ears popped this morning. You can hear a little clearer. I know somebody's joints felt a little bit. They felt that warmth of the Lord. They felt it. They felt it. They felt it because the power of God is in the building. Maybe you just need to go reconcile that bad relationship, that, that one that you messed up on, the one that you, you messed up. You got to go tell somebody you're sorry. It's okay. The Bible says make sure your friend. Go to that person. Get it right. Don't leave earth. Don't leave this church. Don't leave anywhere angry, upset, mad over something that you can't change anyway. Let God humble your heart. Father, I just thank you. I praise you for this word. I thank you for what you've given us to, to share today. I pray, God, that it fell on good ground. And, God, that we can begin to develop, grow, learn to be more like you, conformed to the image of your son. We are not perfect. But in you, we are perfect. We're not wise on our own. But with you, we are wise. We're not wealthy, but with you, all of our needs are met. As the scripture says, in you we live, we move, and we have our being. So I thank you for Jesus, the great example of humility, that even though he did not find it robbery to be equal with God, he emptied himself. He died. He left heaven, a place of comfort, so that he can die a gruesome death on Calvary's cross, 
so they could beat him and spit on him and, and betray him and put a thorn, crown of thorns on his head and then be nailed to a raggedy old cross until he gave up his life so that we could have the life that we live today. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on Calvary's cross. We can't live this life without you. We can't have what we have without your hand being on us. We can't be healed unless you heal us. We can't be delivered unless you deliver us. We can't be transformed unless you transform us by the renewing of our mind and by the power of the Holy Ghost. I pray now in the name of Jesus that you would just fill this room with your presence. Let us feel it, sense it. Let the warmth of the Holy Spirit flow in the name of Jesus down every pew, Lord God, meeting every need, touching every body right now, God. Let sickness depart from this place right now in the name of Jesus. God, I pray, God, that you'll restore our hearts back to proper status. God, help us to fall back in love with you, to desire your word, to desire to be in your presence, to desire to fellowship with you. Help us to draw close to you and your word promises that you'll draw close to us, that you will incline your ear and give us grace so that we can endure this, this world. Help us and give us wisdom, God, to win those who are lost, to tell somebody that Jesus still saved. That's why you came to save sinners, of which I am chief. So I thank you for all that you've done in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. 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 What a mighty God we serve. You can have your seats if you can. For those of you who are on Facebook, I didn't welcome you, but I know you've hopefully you felt welcome. And I want to let you know the same prayer that we prayed here is going to your household right now. I pray that those who listen and were humbled by the word that you heard today, that you would be touched and blessed by the power of the Holy Spirit, just like we were touched and blessed in here. We pray, God, that the same oil that flows in this building flows to you wherever you are. Wherever you may be, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will feel the healing touch that comes from the Life Center Church in Eatonville, Florida. My God, I thank you. We're getting ready to take up a seat. We're getting ready to take up an offering. So go ahead and prepare yourself, prepare your hearts, and prepare your, your minds to give. Oh, gosh, I got my envelope. Here I put it in my pocket. Yeah. All right. Give your best. Give your best. So we can keep doing what we're doing. There is a shift that's taking place in the body of Christ. It's time to go. Harvest is plenteous. But the laborers are few. Harvest is plenteous. There's a lot of people out here who need Jesus. There's a lot of people out here who've been just taught the wrong thing. They're hearing the wrong thing. But no, please know that Jesus Christ is still on the throne. He hasn't changed a bit. We changed church a little bit. We shifted some stuff around, moved some stuff around, and made it all kind of nice and pliable. But Jesus hadn't changed. He still wants us to be holy. He wants us to live holy. He wants us to walk, walk circumspect under his law, under his word, under his provision. Tap out. Jesus, I thank you. I give myself away so you can use me I give myself away yeah I give myself away so you can use me Just before we depart, um, let's just give a hand to Brother Charvis and the, and the musicians and the team there, the choir, you know. God is blessing us. You know, sometimes it's not based on what we see. You know, it's based on his word. We don't see with these. You know, I got four of them now. We don't see with these. We see in the spirit. 
and I see in the spirit. I see more seats being filled. I see people who, are, who don't know what we know. And I see, I, I can see you sitting next to that person, kind of showing them how to find 1 Corinthians in the Bible and showing them how to find Romans and showing them how to find those pieces of scripture. I see, I see, I see you all going out in the communities and going to the old folks home and going to halfway houses and going to the juvenile detention center and telling people that Jesus still lives. See, 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 we can't just limit God to these four walls. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, go to the hedges and highways and compel them to come. Not to the building, but to come to Jesus. And when they come to Jesus and they see the example that you've laid before them, they'll come to the building. We can't invite them to the building and expect them to change. No, you got to go where they are, change them where they are, and then let them come here. My God, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, uh, I need to put this up because we go to, we talk all day about it. All hearts and minds clear? Pastor King, anything? All right. Amen. Hope you all were blessed. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to dismiss. Thank God for you. Thank God for you. Look at somebody that you may or may not know. Just look at them. You might not know them. It's okay. You might know them. Look at him and just tell him I love you. I love you. Stevie Wonder sings these three words, sweet and simple. I love you. I love you. Then tell him this. And mean it when you say it now. Mean this when you say it. Say, I'm praying for you. Now, if you don't know that person that you just spoke to, if you don't know their name, ask them what their name is, write their name down, and then pray for them. And if you feel so led by the Holy Spirit, say a prayer for him right there. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace that you saved us with. We didn't do this on our own. We didn't get this salvation on our own. Jesus, you had to die. And if we're going to live like your example, God, we have to die as well. We have to humble ourselves under you. We have to submit, tap out to say, I can't do this on my own. I need your grace. I pray that the peace of God will cover each and every one of us as we leave this place. And God, that we will go in boldness, knowing that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. God, that you will cover us this week, God, as we pray, as we seek your face, as we go through our job, whatever the things that we do throughout the week, God, help us to keep you in first place in everything, and God, teach us how to humble ourselves and to fall flat on our face before you so that we can find grace and that we'll be exalted in our due season. I thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Hug about three people before you go. Tell them I love you. Ain't too much you can do about it. Ha <laughs> ha.